the chances are very, very good that there are some of you in this room tonight that, um, that are a little skeptical, that are a little curious, that are checking things out, and you're not quite sure if you buy into everything that, that people are saying around you right now, and I totally understand. I actually am glad that you're skeptical, because I've seen over and over how God takes the skeptics, and he convinces them. And when God convinces somebody that's skeptical, they become one of the strongest believers I've ever seen because they experience something that nobody can talk them out of because their skepticism has been transformed into faith and they begin to live something that comes from a place that's their own. And I, I encourage you that if you're here and you're in that position right now where you just, you're skeptical, you're just like, man, I've heard this Jesus stuff before. I just don't know that I'm buying it. I don't know that if that's for me, all these things. I encourage you to just look around this room. Look around with a different set of eyes tonight. Don't look through the eyes of, oh, I know what this person does, and I know that person. They're not perfect, and they say they're a Christian. If you're looking through the eyes of, of sin sniffing and behaviors, you know, watching our behaviors, you're in the wrong business because we're all a bunch of screw-ups, and that's not what it's about. Look past the surface. Do you have peace in your heart? Are you at peace? Because that's what really it's all about. It's not about somebody that used to be immoral and now they live a moral life. It's not about that at all. It's about what Jesus says, that he says, I have come to give you peace. And it's not like this, per this world has. It's the kind of peace that will go through any situation that you go through and the peace will remain and you will go to sleep at night and you will lay your head on your pillow <sighs> and you will be okay. That's what God is wanting to do in your life. He's wanting to give you peace. And it can be yours, just like Chandra said, it can be yours. You just have to say yes. God is not stingy. I am so glad God is not one of us. <laughs> He's not stingy. His resources never run out. He never gets to the end of the month and goes, oh no, we're running short. Sorry, I can't answer that prayer. Uh, you're gonna have to wait till I get paid on the first. It's like, there is, there's no endly end when it comes to the resources of God and what he offers because it's this multiplication dynamic when God invests himself in a person and that person begins to carry the resources of heaven in their being and they begin to give it out, it begins to multiply and it's like God has got the, the greatest system of all. Love turns into more love, it turns into more love, it turns into more love. Grace turns into more grace, more grace. Faith grows into more faith, into more faith. The economy of God is like nothing this world has ever seen before and it's endless. And God is in the business right now of changing this dark world, this world that is in bad, bad shape. He's in the process, one person at a time, into changing these people, and he's causing some serious effects to take place in all of these, these situations that you and I find ourselves in. Last week, we started talking about kind of some heavy stuff that has been building week after week as we've been talking about these two worlds that we find ourselves living between, the natural world and the spiritual world, these two realms that we, that we find ourselves between. Some people dismiss the spiritual realm. They say, oh, that's, I don't believe in the spirit world. If I can't touch it, if I can't like, you know, make sense of it, then I don't want to believe it. If it's not in front of me, then I don't buy it. I don't believe in demons. I don't believe in the devil. I don't believe in all this, this stuff that you hear about and you see. And, and our eyes are you know, covered up and they're blinded. And so we've been talking about this for a while because I encounter this a lot in people. They're just like, man, I just don't believe. And so there's a lot to what goes on. And last week, we started talking about the three different influences that we find in our lives. The three different influences that I believe that most people are, are affected by in their lives. We talked about ourselves. We talked about how our emotions, our desires, our instincts, all the things that we possess are something that leads us. We've been talking about God's spirit for those of us that have chosen to believe in Christ 
and have experienced an awakening in our spirit, how God's spirit can be an influence that leads us. But last week we talked about the devil. We talked about Satan and how the enemy can truly be an influence in our lives. And we looked at several passages, passages of scripture that describe Satan, that describe the devil. We found out that the devil is referred to in the Bible as the ancient serpent the one that's been around since the beginning of, of creation with man and, and woman. And we, we saw the stories there. We, we saw that Satan was referred to as the one that deceives the whole world, the one who goes and, and lies continually, the father of lies, that every lie originates from the work of Satan. And we also found out last week that Satan is, is also described as an angel of light. That one of the things that Satan does is he disguises himself. He likes to hide And so you basically have this being, this character, who is a habitual liar and loves to dress up and hide. And so it becomes a very, very sneaky situation when you're trying to wrap your head around what exactly is is going on. I want to share with you a passage of scripture tonight. It's found in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to look at this passage that we have talked about many, many times before, but tonight we're going to look at it from a little bit different standpoint, and I hope that you, I hope that you learn something tonight. How many of you guys want to learn something tonight? I, I love to learn. All right, I hope, I hope that you're ready. Listen to these words. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. It says, a final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. And then after the battle, you will be standing firm. This is a passage of scripture that we read that refers very, very explicitly to spirit stuff. Things that are happening around us right now that our natural eye cannot see. Things that are taking place right now in a dimension and in a way that it escapes us being able to tangibly touch it but it is very, very real nonetheless. And the reason that we're talking about this is because there's some things that I have learned through, through living my life, walking with God, and through watching other people that are very, very simple things, but I have discovered these things will change and radically transform your experience as a human being as you're pursuing God if you will implement these things. And it starts, number one, with you have to be willing to admit that there are some things that you don't know. Anybody here have a problem with that? Can everybody say, okay, I guess there's maybe one or two things that I don't know. Maybe three, but other than that, I'm good. I know everything. We do not know everything. Some of you just got that. One of the things that you have to accept is that there are some things that you still have to learn. I still have to learn. And I'm going to teach you a few things tonight that some of you know, but some of you don't. And it starts with this passage of Scripture. The first thing that you need to understand is this passage of Scripture talks about the fact that there are literally strategies and schemes and plans that are being concocted in a spiritual fashion all the time. Strategies, schemes, plans, plots. Last year we had this this teaching series that we talked about that was focusing on light and darkness in the scriptures. And it's talking about all the different places where light and darkness clash and collide. And we were talking about the battle that the Bible depicts and how the battle is happening in the heavenly realm and how this battle is taking place in such a way. And yet you and I are being affected by it over and over. And in one of the places we were talking about how literally this battle that is taking place is all, has everything to do with spiritual authority. And you and I find ourselves right in the middle of this battle that is taking place. We are in the crosshairs of this battle between light and darkness. You, whether you realize it or not, 
are very, very valuable. Some of you are like, I don't, dude, I just blend into the shadows. I don't take up much space. I'm not bothering anybody. I don't know what you're talking about. Let me explain something to you. You are so valuable that if light, God, can have his way in your life, he can literally use you to fulfill his plans in this world. People that are hurting right now, people that are struggling in their lives right now can literally have their worlds changed and reversed because you are willing to allow God to work through your life. You are extremely valuable. Now, on the other side, do you realize that you are so valuable that there are plans to disrupt, to destroy, to steal, to kill, and to make just absolute carnage and wreckage of this world And if you are willing to surrender yourself to the darkness, you too can be used as a tool or a vehicle to destroy everything around. Now, I know some of you are just like, I have never thought of myself that way. Okay, I just want you to stop. I want you to look back in your life at some of the stuff that you've had to do with. Do you think that all just came from your mind? Do you think that all just originated with you just having a bad day or a bad week or a bad decade? No. You were involved in a plot. You were involved in a scheme. You were involved in something that you had no idea that you were involved in. Jesus talks about it over and over. In one story, Jesus talks as he's dealing with this this boy that is stricken with a demon, and Jesus takes care of the demon. He tells the demon he has to go. And then he is questioned about it. The the religious leaders question Jesus about his authority. And they say, how did you just do that? I don't understand. You must be doing this by some wicked means. And Jesus says, look, if you're going to go into somebody's house and you're going to have your way in their house, the first thing that you have to do is you have to take care of somebody in that house that's strong. If there's a strong man in that house, the only way you're going to go into that house and have your way is if somebody stronger goes in and handles business and takes care of this guy. And Jesus says, I am that stronger man. And everybody who is filled with my Holy Spirit and begins to operate has that stronger authority operating in their life to be able to have God's plan completely working in their lives. Every person who says yes to Jesus and has God fill them with his Holy Spirit has spiritual authority that you may or may not understand. You have the ability to not have to put up with the dark things that are trying to have their way with you. So why do you? Let's talk about it. I want to give you a definition of something. And I hope that it gives you some kind of an awareness. The definition is for something that I call a spiritual operation. A spiritual operation. It says, is an evil scheme, plot, or plan that is devised to steal from you, to kill you, or to destroy you. A spiritual operation. Say that with me. Spiritual operation. An operation, something that is thought up, something that is is schemed up, something that is drawn out on the whiteboard that says, okay, here's the X's and the O's. If if we do this and we go that way and this happens here, this will take place. An operation that is is coming into play that has as its primary motive your destruction. To steal from you, to mess with you, to disrupt the things that God wants to do in your life. Ephesians 6 talks about these spiritual operations. It says that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. It says, but we are able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. All of the strategies of the devil. There are spiritual operations that have been happening in some of your lives for generations. Long before you were ever even born, there has been a scheme or a play that has been come up with against your entire family, and you don't even know it. And you were born into a family that the devil had already come up with the perfect game plan to just destroy you guys. 
over and over and over and over again. You know, we've, we've gotten to a point in our understanding of the way that things work to where we can understand, oh, I get that one from my dad. Oh, that's my granddad. Oh, that's my great granddad. We can see how this stuff works. But my friends, it goes much deeper than just biology. It goes much deeper than just the things that, that science says that it is. This is spiritual stuff that we're talking about. And these spiritual operations, they don't have to continue in your life. Why? Because there is a stronger authority that God has given to us that you can use that can shut it down and it can happen that fast. But it starts with you saying, okay, first of all, I need to learn a few things. Having a teachable heart, being willing to let God open your eyes and show you some stuff that might freak you out a little bit. But freedom is worth being freaked out a minute. Am I I right? It's like how many of you would just like to live with your eyes closed and your head in the sand and just go, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. All the while, you're totally not fine. Let's open our eyes and let's let God show us what's really going on all around us. We've talked many times about the temptation of Christ and how we see in living color this depiction. And I want to read it really quickly to you because I want you to hear these words from a different perspective tonight. In Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1, we find this interaction between Jesus and Satan. And it says, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted and he became very hungry. During that time, the devil came and said to him, this is the devil talking now. I want you to listen to these words. The devil says to Jesus, if you are the son of God, then tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, no, the scriptures say, people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and he said, if you are the son of God, jump, for the scriptures say, he will order his angels to protect you, and they will hold you up with their hands, so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. But Jesus responded, the scriptures also say, you must not test the Lord your God. Next, the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I will give it all to you, Satan said, if you will kneel down and worship me. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him. For the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then the devil went away and the angels came and they took care of Jesus. In this interaction, you see how Satan is coming at Jesus and he is tempting him with these things that are within Satan's power to give. We know that Scripture teaches us that Satan controls this world, that he has been loosed in this world, and he has been given temporary control to be able to destroy things. And in this passage of Scripture, we see him offering to give Jesus something that Satan has within his power to give. But we don't see is we don't see Jesus giving in to any dialogue or any discussion or any back and forth banter where there's anything in Jesus that wants what Satan has. What we do see is we see Jesus doing something very, very strategic. Every single instance, Jesus resists Satan. Satan is coming at Jesus. Jesus is resisting Satan. He's using his authority. He's speaking the word of God, which is the ultimate authority, and he is resisting against Satan. Notice that Satan doesn't come and say, I am going to take this by force. Satan doesn't take anything by force. He takes everything through temptation. Everything is lure you into do what? Willingly give up your authority. He doesn't force you to do what you do, even though you say, oh, the devil made me do it. The devil didn't make you do anything, okay? But he knows how to talk to you just right to get you to decide that you want to do it. He just entices. It's passive. Think about it. It's passively getting us to give in. And what is it that he is offering? What is it that Satan is doing in this whole situation with Jesus? Though he is offering Jesus something, it's a partial truth, every single one of them. In other words, Satan is lying. 
Last week, we read several scriptures that talk about the fact that everything that Satan says is a lie. It is a lie. When you hear him tempt you, oh man, wouldn't it be great if you did this, this, and this? The allure, the temptation, the hook on the surface appeals to us, but in the underneath, the truth of it is always a lie. It's not gonna give you what you want. It's gonna destroy you. Everything that he says is a lie. And as we begin to think about this and we begin to say, okay, I'm hearing things, what you really need to understand is that what you're hearing is lies over and over and over and over again. Now, I wish in my own life that things were this obvious. Like, I just think, like, man, if Satan just showed up one day, that would just be, like, so obvious, right? Like, it's like, ew, like, get away, dude. Like, I don't want nothing to do with you. It doesn't happen that way in our lives. Satan doesn't show up and just announce himself. He doesn't just make a big, a big hoorah about what he's up to and what he's doing. He's sly. He's subtle. He's disguised. He's lying. He's right here among us right now. And you don't even know it. Doing what he does best. Lie, 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 trying to get somebody to listen. And do what? This is what you need to understand. A spiritual agreement happens when something is offered, accepted, and believed, whether it is, is, is true or a lie. A spiritual agreement. A spiritual agreement is exactly what Satan was trying to do with Jesus. Trying to get Jesus to agree with a lie that was being offered. Your spiritual authority gives you the ability as a Christian to be able to resist the devil in every situation and he has to flee from you, just like Jesus showed us how to do it. He has to flee, but he will not leave if he lies to you and you believe his lie. He will stay right there in your life and he will go to work. You say, well, what does it sound like when the devil lies to you? What is a spiritual agreement? Well, the first thing you need to understand is that when Jesus said no to Satan and he resisted him, an agreement is the opposite of resistance. Think about that for a second. When you agree with something, you're not resisting against it in any way. You are saying yes to it completely. You are giving yourself to it. You are saying, I say yes. And everything in the kingdom of God operates under this premise of faith. Whatever you agree with, you are giving your faith to. You are literally saying, I believe this lie and I am giving my faith to it. And as a result, now this lie has power in my life to mess with me. That sucks, doesn't it? And we've all done it. Every single one of us. Some of us have heard lies that started when we were little kids. They came from somebody that we trusted. We heard it. We accepted it. We believed it. And that agreement took place. And it's been going on in our life ever since. And Jesus wants to teach you that there is freedom available to you to say no to any agreement that you've said yes to. That you never have to stay in agreement with something that is a lie. That you right here, right now can say enough is enough. I'm not going to agree anymore. But we have to start with saying, God, show me what this looks like. Jesus talked about the power of agreement when it comes to prayer. In Matthew chapter 18, he says these words. He says, Jesus tells us, I tell you this, if two of you agree here on earth concerning anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. 
For where two or three gather as my followers, I am there among them. Why does Jesus say that it's so important for there to be two or three together? Agreement. Two or three coming together makes an agreement. I can agree with myself all day long, anytime I want, but it doesn't really change much, right? It's like, Jason, I totally agree with that. Really, Jason? I don't think so. I just not, I'm not seeing it this way. There's no agreement with one individual. A little craziness, maybe. A little voice is being heard, but it takes two. What happens when two people come into a situation, they look at it and they go, you know what, I see this as this, this, and this. What do you see? I see it as this, this, and this too. It's like, okay, there is power in agreement. And Jesus said, in the kingdom, in the spirit realm, this power of agreement is what is very, very real and something that moves things and changes things. And so we begin to say, okay, there's power in agreement in prayer. That's why we encourage you guys to pray with each other. That's why there's so many of us will text each other prayer. We'll put prayer requests here and there. Why? Because it's not about the, the words that you use. Oh, it's got to be this eloquent, loud, you know, quiet, long, short, all these methodologies. No, it doesn't have to be any of those things. What it has to be is it has to be agreed in with somebody. Somebody's got to say, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll agree with that. I will give my faith to that. Let's both come into agreement and use that faith that God's given us and watch what God will do. And it changes things. The power of agreement is a very, very real thing in our lives. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul's writing and he says these words. He says, for though we live as human beings, we do not wage war according to human standards, For the weapons of our warfare are not human weapons, but are made powerful by God for tearing down, you see that word? Strongholds. We tear down arguments and every arrogant obstacle that is raised up against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to make it obey Christ. It says, the weapons of God are powerful to tear down strongholds. What is a stronghold? A stronghold is something in your life that has been formed because you made a spiritual agreement. The spiritual agreement came as a result of a spiritual operation that was come up with against your life. And you're like, all right, dude, you're getting way out in left field right now. I'm not buying any of this. You're going to start telling me aliens are coming for my brain next. I'm not listening to all of this stuff. You don't have to listen. You don't have to listen, I'm telling you. But if you will open your eyes and you will stop blaming all the people around you for your problems... And you will stop thinking, oh, you're the problem, and you're the problem, and you're the problem, and I'm broke, that's the problem, and it's all this stuff. If you will just stop for a second at looking at all the tangible things and start to go, okay, wait wait a second, what's really going on here? You will begin to realize that there is something else that is plotted against you. Why? Because you are so valuable. You are not a throwaway. You are not something that's just discarded with no consequence. You are so valuable. You've been created in the very image of God with his breath filling your lungs. You are so valuable and you are so hated by the darkness. You are hated because you carry the essence of God. Because you look like God. And the devil hates your guts. And he knows how to hurt you. He knows how to get to you. He knows how to make you miserable. He knows how to fill you with anxiety and fear. He knows how to make you depressed. He knows how to make you blame everybody in your your life. He knows how to make you retract when you've been hurt. And he knows how to make you try to control everything so that you won't let get hurt again. He knows how to work you over and over and over again. Why? Because he's got operations from a playbook that is so old that it outlives you by a long shot. And it has been working over and over. There's probably only 
five or six plays in his book, but they just keep working brilliantly. I know the plays he uses in the church. My eyes have been open to it. I see it everywhere. I got friends that are pastors, friends at this church and that church, and I can just watch the play that he's using over and over that lies to us and says, oh, that guy's not like you. Oh, that guy doesn't believe that scripture like you. That guy worships on the wrong day of the week. That guy dresses weird. The worship's all wrong. All these things are bad, bad, bad. What is the lie? The lie is they are different than you. No. There's one faith, one Lord, one baptism, one Father over all and in all. There is no difference in the kingdom of God. You've got the blood of Christ. There is no two types. It is one type. And the enemy uses this over and over, over and over. He uses these spiritual operations. You guys are some smart people. Like, seriously, like when I talk about Gravity Church, I tell people, I'm like, okay, first of all, I've never been one of these guys that gets in a fight. Like, I've just never been that type of guy. Never been violent. I tell them, you know what? If anybody ever messes with me, (laughs) dude, I am covered. Like, I am never, I am not even worried. Never worried. Like, I'm like, I'm I'm good. Second thing, I tell people as I I tell them, I said, These are the toughest people I have ever met in my life. Not because they know how to fight, but because they know how to survive. You guys have shown me the strength of the human spirit and what is capable when you have been dealt a hand in life that absolutely needed to be thrown away and started over. And you haven't thrown your hand away. Instead, you've survived. And now you're coming to God and you're allowing him to restore your life. And all of a sudden, I'm watching these people grow in front of me. And I'm just like, oh my gosh. Like, this is going to be fun. Like, watching what is going to happen with the, the, the strength of what God has given to you. Combined with the spiritual authority that God is going to teach you about. People are going to be loved like crazy because of you. And their lives are going to be changed in a radical, radical way. I say all that because when you start saying, I don't want to believe that the devil's after me. I don't want to believe that this stuff happens. I don't want to believe in these agreements that you're talking about. I don't think there's any power in that. I don't think this is all just hocus pocus or whatever. You don't realize what is right in front of right in front of you, that if you see it, if you can tangibly understand it, if God gives you revelation to know what this means, it means the end of these spiritual operations in your family. It means the end of these spiritual operations that have been concocted to destroy your marriage. It means the end of the spiritual operation that has been designed to make you hate your children because I'm done with them. It is designed to destroy your life. The spiritual operation of poverty that has kept you from being able to get and to keep a job and to feel good about yourself, it's going to end because you're going to see what has been concocted against your family for generations. The end of the spiritual operation of addiction that lies to you and tells you, I have to have something to make me feel okay. And I don't care what you're addicted to. The list is endless of what we get addicted to. But the spiritual operation that happens over and over and over and over again, if you will begin to see, I don't have to. The spiritual authority that God has given me, that that has put inside of me, means that I don't have to. As we go back to that that first scripture that we read in Ephesians chapter 6, it, it's, it, it finishes out by saying these powerful words. It says in verse number 13, it says, put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared In addition to all of these things, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. 
Put on salvation as your helmet and take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers. This, this scripture talks and shows us what exactly is taking place and how our posture is supposed to be. Lots of pastors have, have taught the, the armor of God over and over in such beautiful ways, giving us this imagery of understanding how God wants for us to, to be fitted with all of the things that he's offered to us, to be able to stand in a battle and to be able to be protected and to be able to have the sword of God's word as a weapon and all of these things. But what I want you to see in this passage, and I want you to, to understand and to, to highlight, is that he talks about the posture that we are supposed to have is a posture that says no. He says, put all of this armor, put all of this armor on the feet, the shoes, the head. Why? So that you can stand and do what? Resist. Resist. Do you realize that every spiritual operation that is happening in your life would stop right now if you would do one thing? Resist it. Nope, I'm not doing this anymore. Nope, I'm not blaming them anymore. Nope, it's not gonna be about that anymore. No, the, no, no, I'm going to do something. I am going to resist against what has been happening in my life that I have done what? Passively gone with and just let it happen. Do you realize that authority only works when you use it? Somebody can be in charge, and if they never blow the whistle or they never say, hey, time out, you know, that's not right or whatever, they can be in authority all they want, but if they never use their authority, they just stand idly by and watch. What happens? Anything that wants to happen happens. But once authority is stepped in and said, enough is enough, enough is enough, things change. Husbands, if you are in this room right now and you are married, Scriptures teach us that God looks at you and says, you are the designated one in your house for your family that I am expecting for you to have eyes that are open that you're looking around and saying, whoa, 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 no, not going to happen in my house anymore. I'm not going to let my family be destroyed by spiritual operations that are happening because God's going to hold me accountable as the authority. God doesn't say men are more important or men are better than women. As a matter of fact, we, I, I got a whole sermon on how I think that it's the other way. Women are a lot smarter. But anyway, the thing is, is that God says, men, you've got a role to play. And the role that you have to play means that when God sees your household, I tell my brothers all the time, this is the way that in my naive mind, my stupid, silly way, I think of things. I'm like, okay, I think like God's up here and he looks down on me and he sees me and he's like, what do I see in Jason's house? And you know what he sees? He sees me. And then you know what else he sees? He sees under me and protecting all of my wife and my children right here. I've got them. I'm protecting them. I'm keeping them right where they're supposed to be. God's like, good job, Jason. You've got them protected right now. But you know what a lot of times it happens? I step away. And I allow things to happen, spiritual operations to take place in my house that never should take place because I am giving in to something rather than resisting against it. And God says, stand firm and resist. Moms, you for your children. There's a lot of us in this room that are single, a lot of us in this room that are divorced, a lot of us in this room that our families have been fractured and destroyed. So grateful for the grace of God and how he meets us right where we're at no matter what. You moms in this room that are doing your best to raise your children up and trying to bring them up in the ways of the Lord, do you realize that you have to resist against the schemes that the devil is using to try to destroy your babies? You have to say no and you have to resist. You cannot look at their bad mouths and their bad attitudes and think, oh, that's the problem right there. No, it's way deeper than that. God wants you to see something that goes way beyond the surface. And God wants for you to resist against these things. Jesus showed us how to do it. Satan came to him and said, and said here it is. And Jesus said, no, I resist. And Satan had to flee. It also says in Ephesians 6, and I'm gonna end with this. I love how it says, 
that we are to put on the body armor, or some translations say the breastplate of God's righteousness. You know what this literally means, this picture of the breastplate or body armor? It literally means that God has given to us his holiness and his perfection. And he said, this is what is going to keep you completely covered and protected. Me. I'm going to give you me. I don't want you to stand in your own righteousness. I don't want you to stand on your own record. I don't want you to stand on the things that you think are good about yourself. I want you to hear, take my righteousness and find the safety and the protection and the covered feeling that I am safe right here because of it. And when you begin to experience the righteousness of God, the grace that he gives to us and the feeling that you feel, God, thank you so much. Let's pray. God, tonight in this room, right here in this moment, I thank you that you know how to talk to us. You know how to speak to us, God, in a way that goes past our intellect, it goes past our arguments, it goes past our mind, it goes past everything. And you can speak to our hearts right here, God. And Lord, I pray right now that you would give us the kind of faith to be able to say yes to what you're talking to us about. To say yes to you, God. Lord, I pray for every person in this room right now that is struggling, Lord, in their journey. Father, and I pray that in this moment that you would give them breakthrough, Lord. I pray that you would give them breakthrough in a way that they need so badly. That they would experience joy and hope. I pray, oh God, that you would give them faith. Father, I pray that you would break our hard hearts down and give us repentance. God, have your way in us. Though we're not here to play games, we're not here because there's nothing better to do. We're here, God, because we want to know you, we want to follow you, and we want to love you and serve you. And God, we want to know what that means and what that looks like. Have your way in our lives, Lord.